The House will be in order. Prayer will be offered by our chaplain, Father Conroy. Let us pray. Dear God, we give you thanks for giving us another day. Bless abundantly the members of this people's house. During the season of new growth, may your redemptive power help them to see new ways to productive service, fresh, fresh approaches to understanding each other, especially those across the aisle, and renewed commitment to solving the problems facing our nation. May they and may we all be transformed by your grace and better reflect the sense of wonder even joy at the opportunities to serve that are ever before us. The issues of our day are a challenge for a nation who claims your blessing. May we not forget the reminders to your chosen people of once having been oppressed foreigners and the admonitions of scripture that we might be entertaining angels and the strangers among us. Help the members of this house to find a balance that meets the demands of our beliefs with the practical realities that challenge us as a complex nation. May all that is done this day be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the house his approval thereof. Pursuant to clause one of rule one, the journal stands approved. What purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Mr. Speaker, the clause one of rule one, I demand a vote on the speaker's approval of the journal. Now the question is on the speaker's approval of the journal. Those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Are those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, the journal stands approved. The gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Speaker, I request the yeas and the nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. Sufficient number having arisen. Uh, the, the yeas and nays are ordered pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20. Further proceedings on this question are postponed. Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The chair will entertain up to 15 requests for one-minute speeches on each side of the aisle. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? Permission to address the House for one minute. Does the gentleman ask unanimous consent to address the House unanimous for one minute? Consent so ordered. Mr. Speaker, President Obama finally released his 2014 budget this week. Two months late and trillions of dollars short. Similar to last year's plan, it taxes more to spend more. While the President claims his budget will reduce the deficit in a balanced way, it won't ever balance, not in 10 years, not ever. The President's plan is $8.2 trillion of new debt. It also includes a $1.1 trillion in new taxes. Hardworking taxpayers don't deserve more taxes. They deserve a budget that allows them to keep more of their own money and not worry about financial debt being placed on their children and grandchildren. House Republicans have passed such a budget, one that balances a proactive budget that eliminates the deficit while also providing economic security for employers and employees, a sustainable safety net for the poor and those retiring, and a secure future for our children and grandchildren. Americans know what it takes to create a balanced budget for their own families and their own businesses and they deserve the same from their government. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For purposes, the gentleman from Illinois rise. Without objection. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the founder of Earth Day, Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson, was asked in 2005, just before his death at the age of 89, if Earth Day should be celebrated. Our work's not finished, he replied. There's a lot more that needs to be done. As we enter wildfire season, watershed infrastructure that would mitigate future contamination of local rivers and reservoirs is still, still being rebuilt from last season. And funding for rebuilding is only now being allocated, having been delayed under sequestration, affecting lives and homes. We've yet to craft an agenda that talks of a multi-year transportation plan 
or climate change. And of course, the Green legislator at heart would love to see tools like the Antiquities Act as a job creating mechanism rather than spending time on the floor fighting against rolling back NEPA as we're doing this week with H.R. 678 unnecessarily at the expense of supporting hydropower as we should. No, our work's not finished. There's a lot more to be done. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. What purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, in 2009, the United States surpassed Russia in becoming the world's largest producer of natural gas. Due to recent technological advancements, large deposits of natural gas, mainly shale gas, are now being harvested. Through the use of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, previously inaccessible hydrocarbons are now seeing the light of day. Having a Henry Hub located in the center of the 3rd Congressional District, I'm fully aware that the market price of U.S. natural gas is an, at an all-time low and much lower than Asian and European natural gas prices. While this fact presents challenges, it also provides an opportunity for our nation to fast become a global energy hub by exporting one of our most abundant natural resources in the form of liquefied natural gas, or LNG. With domestic ma uh, demand being met, exporting LNG leads to job creation at home, a reduction in the national trade deficit, and an increase in revenues for the federal government. As a member of the House Ways and Means Subcommittee on Trade, these are all value-added benefits for our nation. The domestic natural gas boom presents the United States with an enormous economic opportunity and geopolitical opportunity. Our nation should seize this opportunity and not let it pass. It's in the public interest. The gentleman's time has expired. What purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, this week I took part in a town hall meeting in Buffalo along with the Alliance for American Manufacturing to discuss the importance of manufacturing jobs to our region and to our nation. With Western New York's dedicated workforce and history of manufacturing success, we are ready to grow our economy with the resurgence of advanced manufacturing industry. But to do this, our workers and businesses need a willing partner in their government. This Congress must make investing in our infrastructure and investing in our people top priorities. Robust funding to rebuild roads and bridges, along with fostering job training programs and passing legislation in the House Democrats' Make It in America agenda will enable us to compete with any other nation in the world. Mr. Speaker, investing in American manufacturing creates jobs and reduces the deficit. There is much work to be done, and there are Americans who need the work. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For purpose, the gentleman from Nebraska rise. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, we engage in so much Washington speak in our debates. Words like sequestration, continuing resolutions, and debt ceiling. And the structure of our debate, I feel, can be so off-putting to many Americans. So let's try to be a little more straightforward. The reality is that, is that we have a huge mismatch between revenues and expenditures. We all know that this is a struggle, but we have to get our fiscal house in order just like American families do, businesses do, and even local governments do. But instead of hashing through the same old debates, perhaps there is an easier way forward. Right here, Mr. Speaker, is a General Accountability Office report that came out this week. It's a new report that builds upon former reports. There are more than 300 areas where we can tackle redundant spending across the federal government. So here's the right place to start, Mr. Speaker, delivering a smarter and more effective government while also saving money. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose the gentleman from Virginia rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, throughout the United States, in red and blue states alike, we have speed limits for travel on public roads. These laws are good public policy because they prohibit behavior that can endanger the lives of others. But imagine if we blocked our police from using speed detection devices so they could never prove that you were speeding, or if we only allowed the use of those devices on certain roads. Such a policy would make speed limits mere suggestions with no consequences for those who violated the law. 
It sounds ridiculous, but this is exactly the strategy we currently use to prohibit the purchase of firearms by criminals and those with serious mental illness. Federal law bans the purchase of guns by dangerous people, but massive loopholes in our background check system permit at least 40% of purchases to evade the law without detection by law enforcement. The NRA and their supporters often claim that we need to enforce the laws on the books. Agreed. And universal background checks are designed to do just that, provide an actual enforcement mechanism, and that's what the Congress should do because 90% of the American public want us to do it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman's time has expired. What is the purpose of the gentleman from Ohio rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, this week the President hosted a star-studded concert at the White House for his friends, featuring music of Otis Redding and others. One of Otis Redding's lines in his Sitting on the Dock of the Bay sums up my thoughts on the President's budget. Looks like nothing's going to change. Everything remains the same. Just like the Senate, the President's budget raises taxes, increases the debt, and never, ever, ever balances. The Obama budget has a trillion dollars in new taxes on top of the trillion dollar Obamacare tax and the six hundred billion dollar fiscal cliff tax from earlier this year. The Obama budget spends forty six trillion, borrows another eight trillion, increases the national debt twenty five point four trillion over the next ten years. And after all those taxes and all that spending, we still have a budget that never, ever, ever balances. Mr. President, we can't borrow forever. We can't keep spending more than we take in. These problems are staring us right in the face. <clears throat> but the big spenders in Washington are just sitting on the dock of the bay, wasting time. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to commend the contributions of the biopharmaceutical and medical technology compass in New Jersey to Hurricane Sandy relief activities. New Jersey companies in the biopharmaceutical field have donated an estimated $11.1 million towards Sandy relief efforts. The New Jersey biopharmaceutical and medical technology companies made contributions to a large number of organizations, including the American Red Cross, AmeriCares, Direct Relief International, Feeding America, the Salvation Army, Save the Children, United Way, and the Hurricane Sandy New Jersey Relief Fund. The community also coordinated with the Department of Health and Human Services to ensure an uninterrupted supply chain of critical life-saving drugs, as well as, as well as teamed up with local pharmacies to provide free and discounted prescriptions to affected patients. In addition, individual comp companies perform a variety of services in the immediate aftermath of Sandy, including the distribution of hygiene kits, provide generators to local municipalities, deploying emergency decontamination units, preparing food for first responders, working to supply hospitals, pharmacies, and retailers with supplies to their patient and customer needed. And While our communities are hoping expired. together, we thank the biopharmaceutical industry of New Jersey. The gentleman's time has expired. What purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina rise? Ask for unanimous consent to address the House for a minute and I extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, there is much that could be said about the President's proposed budget, but I think ordinary taxpayers need to know its impact on jobs and the economy. Economists and national accounting firms have stated that the tax increases that President Obama pushed through in January have slowed the economy and contributed to a loss of 24,000 retail jobs in March, part of a very dismal jobs report. When consumers have less money in their pockets, the inevitable results in fewer jobs. Apparently, President Obama has not learned from this mistake. His budget contains almost $600 billion and even more new taxes at a time when millions of Americans are giving up hope of finding a job and exiting the workforce President Obama's budget will only inflict more pain on ordinary families. House Republicans have passed a responsible budget that leads to balance while also preserving Social Security and Medicare. Let's work together for a fiscally accountable government that will help restore jobs to American families. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, today the Senate is taking up common sense legislation to help reduce gun violence in America. 
I have and always will be a staunch supporter of the Second Amendment, and I strongly support the constitutional rights of my constituents to own guns. This bipartisan legislation to expand background checks does not infringe on the rights of law-abiding gun owners. Instead, it strengthens our existing system of background checks to help keep guns out of the hands of dangerous offenders. Forty percent of guns sold in the United States currently don't go through background checks. Failing to act means that just anyone can continue to buy weapons at gun shows or over the Internet without being subject to a background check. The vast majority of Americans support background checks. Democrats and Republicans support background checks. The vast majority of responsible gun owners support background checks. It's common sense legislation that should be enacted. It will make our country safer, and I urge the House to take this up as soon as the Senate completes its work. Thank you. Gentlemen, time has expired. For what purpose the gentleman from Montana rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, last week I was home in Montana to highlight the important role that natural resources play in our state's economy. In fact, I put 3,000 miles to travel around our great state. One question I was asked repeatedly was, when will the Keystone Pipeline be approved? We all know the tremendous economic impact that the Keystone Pipeline would have and the jobs that would be created. But when I was in Glasgow, Montana, I learned of a relatively unknown benefit as a result of the pipeline. You see, Norval Electric Co-op in Glasgow is slated to supply electricity to one of the Keystone XL pump stations. If the pipeline is built, this rural electric co-op will be able to spread their cost burdens with the pipeline and consequently hold rates steady for their 3,000 plus Montana customers. But if the pipeline is not approved, they told me that Norval customers will see upwards of a 40 percent increase in their utility rates over the next 10 years. As I've said time and time again, this is common sense. Keystone means jobs. It means another step towards energy independence, and it means lower utility rates for rural Montanans, for hardworking Montana families. President Obama, it's time to approve the Keystone Pipeline. Gentlemen's time has expired. For purposes, the gentleman from California rise. Without objection. Thank you very much. I, I rise to thank the faith-based communities in this country for praying for a humane and just immigration reform. We heard from the chaplain today his prayer, and we all probably caught there were three references. The first one was from Leviticus 19, the issue of treating the foreign-born as your own. Then we heard the Hebrews treating the stranger because you don't know, treat him well because he may be the angel among you. And then, of course, lastly, Matthew 25, treating the stranger, of course, because that's how you're going to be judged. And so I want to thank each and every pastor, each and every priest, each and every rabbi that has been praying for us on this issue. I think that hardened hearts are changing here. Certainly the debate that we've been having has been humane. Much of the leadership has come from a bipartisan group of Democrats and Republicans with open hearts, and I appreciate that. And that has not happened by itself. It's happened because of the prayers and the supplications of all of these people around the nation saying we have to do something that matches our values. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That has expired. For what purpose the gentleman from Missouri rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the President just, re just released budget calls for higher taxes, more spending, and bigger government, all of which would make it more difficult for hardworking Americans like those in the 3rd District of Missouri to find jobs. More troubling yet is the President's budget simply does not balance. Every ba family must balance this budget, and we in Washington should too. We can't continue to spend money we don't have, and it's not right for the President to take more to spend more. Several weeks ago, I proudly supported a Republican budget that provides for a balanced budget will foster a healthier economy and cre help create jobs. The President's budget, meanwhile, holds any reforms and spending cuts hostage in exchange for more tax hikes. The American people are tired of the same old song and dance from the President and his allies when it comes to spending their hard-earned tax dollars. This budget proposal, which is months overdue, isn't a serious plan. Mr. Speaker, I'm from the show-me state, and this budget doesn't show me anything. 
I yield back. The gentleman yields back for the purpose of the gentleman from Tennessee rise. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio mentioned the concert that the president uh, hosted with PBS and uh, uh, the Grammys on Tuesday and did a poor just imitation, I guess, of Justin Timberlake on sitting on the dock of the bay. It was a phenomenal show, and it was a shout-out to Memphis Music. And while there were a lot of great performers there, I want to put a particular shout-out to uh, Miss Cindy Lauper, because she's special. Uh, she, she did another Otis Redding song, Try a Little Tenderness, and it was a phenomenal performance. And I would suggest to some of my colleagues on the other side, they ought to try a little tenderness on occasion. Uh, Miss Lauper's special, she did an album called Memphis Blues in 2010. It was one of the best albums of the year. It brought blues back. She's had Memphians B.B. King and Ann Pebbles and uh, Charlie Musselwhite on the album. She's a phenomenal lady, and I give her a special shout-out to Cindy Lauper and Memphis Music. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose the gentleman from Indiana rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After decades of Washington irresponsibility, Americans are facing nearly $17 trillion of debt and struggling through a deficit-driven unemployment crisis. Unfortunately, this administration isn't offering solutions. Yesterday, President Obama introduced a budget that never, ever balances and will only make these problems worse. Two months after he missed the law's deadline, President Obama introduced a reheated version of the same failed tax, borrow, and spend policies that created this mess to begin with. President Obama's budget raises taxes by $1.1 trillion, adds another $8.2 trillion to the national debt, and doesn't come close to addressing the long-term stability of our country's safety net programs. Under the President's plan, taxpayers can expect consequences of endless deficits and future downgrades. House Republicans are offering a real solution. We've put forward a reasonable plan that actually balances the budget in 10 years, not because we're interested in spreadsheets and timetables, but because Americans shouldn't have to wait any longer for success and prosperity. Let's balance the budget and put our trust in hardworking Americans. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Ohio rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House Board. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, elementary schools, high schools, movie theaters, universities, and shopping malls have all been scenes of horrific incidents where innocent lives were lost along with our sense of security. After each tragedy, we hear sermons, speeches, console survivors and loved ones, but we in Congress have done little to change the way we address gun violence. I want to change that. While massacres such as the one that occurred in Newtown draw significant attention to the issues of gun violence, it is a persistent problem throughout the nation. According to a recent John Hopkins University survey, a solid majority of Americans, gun owners and non-gun owners alike, support several initiatives to slow gun violence. For example, 89% of all respondents and 75% of those identified as NRA members support universal background checks for gun sales. President Obama's plan also calls for a ban on military assault weapons and high-capacity machines, like the kind that have been commonly used in so many of the mass shootings we have witnessed in the United States. We can never prevent all crimes or gun violence, but we can work together to find ways to limit the loss of lives with common sense solutions. Gentlelady's time has expired. What the purpose is the gentleman from North Carolina rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, over the past two months, federal official after federal official has talked about the need to furlough employees due to sequestration. Yet the government continues to hand out millions of dollars in bonuses to federal employees. Seventy-five percent of senior executive service employees receive bonuses at an average of $13,081. Regular, oftentimes blue-collar federal workers are facing furloughs while senior employees are cashing in. The FAA has been talking about 90-minute waits for passengers, but yet in fiscal year 2011, they handed out 
$40,000 bonuses to more than 86 different employees. This is unacceptable, and the recent OMB guidelines don't go f far enough. The Common Sense and Compensation Act uh, bill that I am introducing today would prohibit those bonuses for the rest of fiscal year 2013 and cap them at a maximum of 5 percent of the salary going forward. I urge my colleagues to co-sponsor. Thank Time you. Time has expired. What purpose does the gentlewoman from Florida rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, it's now been 830 days since I arrived in Congress, and the Republican leadership has still not allowed a single vote on serious legislation to address our unemployment crisis. I have news for my colleagues. Unemployment is our true deficit. By getting Americans trained and back to work, we can increase our tax base and stop our borrowing. By reducing unemployment, we can stop our national epidemic of foreclosures. Regardless of the assistance you receive, you cannot keep your home if you do not have a job. My state is the nation's foreclosure state, and my hometown in Miami is the foreclosure capital. Mr. Speaker, unemployment is destroying families and depressing property values. It is devastating our people and dragging down our recovery. Our mantra should be in this Congress, jobs, jobs, jobs. And the gentlelady's time has expired. What purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Without it. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, members of Congress have just come back now from two weeks of recess being at home. And group after group after group that I spoke with talked about exactly the same thing that the previous speaker and others were talking about, and that is jobs. Job creation and the opportunity for our children and sometimes our spouses to get back into the jobs marketplace. And I remind the people of Dallas, Texas, that there's really a tale of two states or two cities. And one is Dallas, Texas, and Chicago, Illinois the state of Illinois versus Texas. Texas, over the last few years, has created more jobs than the other 49 states combined. The reason why we've done this is because we chose not to do the path that Illinois has done, and that is raising taxes, lowering job expectations and performance, and the ability for people to want to invest in that state in their future. Mr. Speaker, that's exactly the same background and philosophy that our president and Democrats are having, to run jobs out of America. I stand for the Texas model, lowering taxes and making sure we have jobs. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask now consent to the question. Without objection. Mr. Speaker. I'm happy that finally we are moving forward on gun violence prevention legislation in this country. And I really applaud our senators, Joe Manchin and Pat Toomey, for coming together finally in a bipartisan fashion to push forward legislation to expand background checks uh, in gun shows and for online purposes. And this is purchases, and this is a strong first step towards a meaningful solution to end gun violence in this country. And I hope the House, I hope we take this up soon and pass this legislation. But I think we need to do more. And if losing 20 young innocent lives doesn't shake us up to end this epidemic of gun violence that has plagued our nation's neighborhoods, schools, and churches, then nothing will. If we harden our hearts to the tears and the testimonies of the parents of Newtown here with us this week, then we're telling every family that has been shattered by a gun and every family uh, that has been shattered by this kind of violence that if we don't act, we're washing our hands of their agony. You know, I hope that we still have a ban on military-style assault weapons and high-capacity gun magazines, but this is a good first start. Gentlelady's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlelady from North Carolina rise? 
I ask unanimous <laughs> consent to address the House for one minute, Mr. Speaker. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Saving Medicare and Social Security for future generations is something Republicans and Democrats can and should agree on. The House Republican budget preserves Social Security and Medicare for current seniors and future generations by beginning the work of making incremental cost-saving reforms. President Obama, however, sees the threat to Medicare and Social Security solvency as a chance to get more of what he wants. While Medicare and Social Security are going bankrupt, the President is refusing to consider reforms to save our senior safety nets unless he's allowed to raise taxes in exchange. When it comes to tax increases, how quickly the president forgets. The president just got done raising taxes on the American people on January 1st. The American people send enough of their hard-earned money to Washington each year, and more should not be taken from them to enable further travails in misguided stimulus. Reforms to save Medicare and Social Security are critically important to future generations of Americans. They should be treated as more than bargaining chips by the President. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Nevada rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to celebrate the life of Jean Segerblum, who recently passed away at the age of 94. A true public servant to the end, Jean served uh, Nevada throughout her life, first as a high school teacher, then a Boulder City City Councilman, and finally as a four-term assemblywoman in the Nevada State Legislature, beginning at the young age of 74. While in the legislature, she worked hard to defend the rights of women and children, as well as to protect the environment and Nevada's beauty, which was painted by her husband, Cliff, in many beautiful watercolors. The Sagerbloom family has been a fixture in Nevada politics for four generations. Jean's legacy continues through her son, Tick, who is a state senator today. Tick put it perfectly when he said simply, she loved Nevada. My mother always had a smile on her face and she never had a bad day. I miss her personally and Nevada mourns her loss. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Without objection. Over the past break, I had a chance to go home to the beautiful Georgia Nine where I'm born and raised. And one of the things that I find when I go back is always refreshing because I go back and people seem to want to find answers. They find answers to the problems of their life. They want to know what is happening and they do not understand inside the Beltway thinking. It simply adds more and more talk and more and more rhetoric. Over the past week, I have sat in two committees in which the government's own inspectors have found waste, have found duplication, have found fragmentation in which everything is going in a way in which people back home don't understand. Sometimes we come to this well and we say, people, we need to come together. Well, what we've got to understand is what we've just heard the last two weeks is from people in our district is that they want to see action. They don't understand sequester when you've got all this money sitting out there that is being wasted in duplication in programs such as three programs to study catfish. As I said in the committee the other day, I've, grown, I've fished for catfish all my life. I don't understand why we need that much inspection. What we need now is action to cut the waste. We've put a, proposed a balanced budget from the Republican perspective. We're going to continue to fight to put our fiscal house in order. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? The gentleman's recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker. The gun safety debate that we are having is not about politics or political means. It is about doing what's right for, by our families, protecting our children, and reducing the gun violence that persists in the streets of my district every single day. If Congress has the power to prevent some of this senseless violence, then we have a moral obligation to do so. Background checks are an absolute must. Criminals and the mentally ill should not be able to go online or walk into a gun show and walk away with a gun. My bill, the Safer Neighborhoods Gun Buyback Act, provides a 25% markup on guns traded in, creating an incentive to get the mostly wild, most widely used guns in crimes off of our streets. It's not complicated. These are common sense reforms. 
and the victims of gun violence and their families deserve a vote. So I urge my Republican colleagues to bring this legislation to the floor. We owe it to the American people, and New Jersey families should not have to wait any longer for common sense reform. Has expired. I'll yield back. <clears throat> for what purpose does the gentlewoman from New Hampshire rise? Without objection. This week marks the 50th anniversary of a terrible submarine disaster, the USS Thresher, the first in a new class of subs designed to answer the Soviet threat in the Cold War, left the world's greatest shipyard, the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, to conduct sea trials on April 10, 1963. Disaster struck and America lost 129 of their finest men that day. I honor these men who are on eternal patrol, and I honor their families, their wives, and their children, some of whom never met their dads. Their sacrifices did lead to a sub-safety program. One of the surviving children wrote a song about his dad, and he said, a man whose love is stronger than the tide that's taken you away. Let's pause and remember these great men and their families. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back for what purpose does a gentlewoman from Florida rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I'm here because of Angel. Angel was just an ordinary teenager. Uh, she loved basketball. She liked to hang out. In fact, that's all she was doing on a balmy night in West Palm Beach, just hanging out uh, when she was violently killed by a man devoid of humanity, armed with a gun. And so, instead of dressing Angel for her prom, her mother dressed her for her funeral. Instead of attending Angel's graduation, her family visited her gravesite. Isn't it time to take the guns out of the hands of criminals and madmen? Isn't it time for this Congress to stop the senseless gun violence. Mr. Speaker, let us vote. I yield back my time. The gentlewoman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection. Mr. Speaker. This week, Mr. Hoyer launched his Make It in America initiative to strengthen our manufacturing se sector and spur job growth. American manufacturing has been a bright spot in our economic recovery. But too often I hear from my district that a lack of skilled workers is limiting their op opportunities for growth. In Illinois' 10th district, we have nearly 700 manufacturing facilities employing over 98,000 people. These businesses and our country will remain globally competitive only if we continue to develop and train our workforce with the skills necessary for the highly technical work the 21st century economy requires. That's precisely why I introduced the America Works Act and I'm proud to have it included in the Make It in America agenda. This common sense legislation promotes collaboration between industry lead leaders, colleges and job training programs to prepare students and workers with the precise skills and jobs where talented people are most needed. America Works and the Make It in America agenda is the comprehensive approach we need to ensure success for American workers and manufacturers. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from North Carolina rise? Mr. Speaker, by direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 146 and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk report the resolution. House calendar number 15, House Resolution 146. Resolved that upon the adoption of this resolution, it shall be in order to consider in the House the bill, H.R. 1120, to prohibit the National Labor Relations Board from taking any action that requires a quorum of the members of the board until such time as board constituting a quorum shall have been confirmed by the Senate the Supreme Court issues a decision on the constitutionality of the appointments to the board made in January 2012 or the adjournment sine die of the first session of the 113th Congress. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. 
in lieu of the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Education and the Workforce, now printed in the bill, an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of Rules Committee Print 113-6 shall be considered as adopted. The bill as amended shall be considered as read. All points of order against provisions in the bill as amended are waived. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill as amended and on any further amendment thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one, one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Education and the Workforce, and two, one motion to recommit with or without instructions. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized for one hour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the purpose of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, pending which I yield myself such time as I may consume. During consideration of this resolution, all time yielded is for the purpose of debate only. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection. House Resolution 146 provides for a closed rule providing for consideration of H.R. 1120, the Preventing Greater Uncertainty in Labor Management Relations Act. Although the Rules Committee solicited amendments last week, we received only two amendments, one Democrat, one Republican, neither of which was germane to the bill. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues on the House Education and Workforce Committee and I have been hard at work conducting oversight and challenging the National Labor Relations Board on its anti-job agenda. In January 2012, President Obama made three so-called recess appointments to the National Labor Relations Board while Congress was not in recess in violation of the Constitution. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia recently ruled these appointments were unconstitutional. This decision calls into question every action the board has taken since these so-called recess appointments were made. The bill before us today, H.R. 1120, would provide greater certainty for employers and unions by requiring the board to cease all activity that requires a three-member quorum and prohibits the board from enforcing any decision made since the appointments in question were made in January 2012. It is important to note also what this bill does not do. It does not prohibit the National Labor Relations Board's regional offices from accepting and processing charges of unfair labor practices. The bill also allows the board to resume activities if one of the three following conditions is met. The, Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court rules on the constitutionality of recess appointments, a quorum of the board is confirmed by the Senate, or the expiration of the recess appointees terms at the end of this year. Finally, H.R. 1120 ensures any action approved by the so-called recess appointees is reviewed and approved by a future board that has been constitutionally appointed. As my colleagues across the aisle are sure to point out, the President has recently nominated three individuals for Senate confirmation in addition to the two he nominated in February. The bill before us remains necessary as a common sense pause button on the board's activities while the legal uncertainty is resolved. It would give employers and unions the certainty they need to operate in the interim. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of this rule and the underlying bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlelady reserves. The gentleman from Colorado. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentlelady for yielding the customary 30 minutes, uh, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in opposition to both the rule and the underlying bill. Uh, the bill is uh, inaccurately named. In fact, quite to the contrary, uh, the bill should be called the Creating Greater Uncertainty in Labor Management Relations Act. 
uh, throwing into question uh, actions of this board, uh, decisions on both sides, as well as uh, agreements uh, that have been uh, reached uh, through the process uh, in the interest of both business as well as working Americans. Two weeks ago, uh, Congress approved a continuing resolution on a bipartisan basis to prevent the federal government from closing. Uh, there were give and take. There were things in it from both sides that weren't perfect. But nevertheless, the majority and minority in this House, the Republicans and Democrats, worked together in good faith, successfully, to prevent a government shutdown, consistent with what the American people wanted and consistent with any responsible stewardship of the public trust. After achieving that, I, I was initially optimistic that when the House reconvened this week, uh, we might be able to build on the spirit of compromise, perhaps tackling the uh, difficult issue of fixing our broken immigration system and replacing it with one that works, that restores the rule of law, perhaps dealing with some of the gun safety issues that are being debated across society, perhaps dealing with tax reform and bringing down our rates and broadening the base, uh, perhaps dealing with finally balancing our budget deficit. But instead, uh, here we are, uh, back in Congress, picking up where we were before we worked together on the continuing resolution, passing pointless bills for presumably political reasons, bills that have no sign of passage in the Senate, bills that have a, uh, a direct uh, veto threat from the President of the United States, which is in his uh, statement of administrative policy, which I entered into the record last night in the Rules Committee, and just as importantly, bill, a bill that has no positive impact on the most important issue facing our country today, job creation, economic growth. Mr. Speaker, this bill is an attack on American workers, and this bill is an attack on American businesses. Pure and simple, H.R. 1120 would effectively shut down the National Labor Relations Board, invalidate all 569 decisions that the NLRB made between January 12th uh, and March of this year. Now, my colleagues claim this is a response to the D.C. Circuit Court decision. But when have we ever enshrined an intermediate court decision into statute? Uh, it makes absolutely no sense. This court decision found that nearly all recess appointments are invalid. But the reality is the decision of the D.C. Circuit conflicts entirely with judicial precedent and past practice. President Reagan made 232 resource recess appointments. George H.W. Bush made 78. George W. Bush made 171. So far, President Obama has made 32, uh, far less than his predecessors. In fact, every president since Reagan has appointed a member of the NLRB through a recess uh, appointment. In the absence of legislative action, uh, the, any responsible chief executive takes the prerogative to make our laws and system of government work. Look, if this body fails to pass immigration reform, the president might build upon the deferred action program and try to do what he can for detention reform. We need to change the laws, but failing that, what can a president do besides try to make those laws work? In the absence of taking up ESEA reauthorization, in the absence of replacing No Child Left Behind with a federal education law that gets accountability right and expands and replicates what works in public education and improves what isn't working, in the absence of doing that, the President and Secretary Duncan have taken the prerogative to grant waivers for states on a statutory framework that we know is insufficient and doesn't work. So, again, it's no surprise that in the absence of taking up nominees, the President used his recess, recess appointment power to make sure that the important functions of government could continue. Uh, when have we ever, as a House, responded directly to intermediate circuit court decisions by instantly uh, making them statutes? Um, look, the uh, majority of this House of Representatives wasn't so confident in the D.C. Circuit when it said that Obamacare was constitutional. We didn't see bills instantly to say Obamacare is constitutional because the D.C. District Court said it was constitutional. What about when the D.C. District Court upheld the constitutionality of civil unions in Washington, D.C.? Was there a bill for my colleagues on the other side to instantly say that civil unions are, are constitutional? Uh, look, this is in process through the judicial branch of government. 
We need to wait until the Supreme Court has decided if they'll even rule in this case uh, before we decide what to do on a statutory basis. The executive branch needs to make the mechanisms of government work to the best of their ability. The legislative branch makes the laws. The judicial branch determines if either of the other two branches impugn the rights of one another or of the American people. It's a system that's served us well since our founding, and it's one that this bill flies in the face of. Uh, again, despite this bill's uh, title, Preventing Greater Uncertainty in Labor Management Relationships, it actually achieves the exact opposite, creates greater uncertainty in labor management relationships. It throws judicial precedent and nearly 600 NLRB rulings into limbo. American businesses would be severely harmed if this bill were to become law, which of course there's no chance of, won't be taken up by the Senate, the President would veto it. But were it to become law, like many other political measures that have been pursued in this body, it would generate regulatory uncertainty that would hang over business, hurting their valuations, preventing hiring of new employees, hurting the public marketplace, uh, impacting entrepreneurs, employers, and workers to the detriment of our economy, destroying jobs in this country. Without a forum in which to mediate disagreements, labor and management alike have no recourse to iron out their differences and less incentive to iron out their differences. Passage of this bill could cause more strikes from workers, damaging businesses and hurting workers. Uh, the underlying bill could very well be named the Strike Promotion Act. Instead of allowing members and encouraging both sides of labor management disputes to offer improvements and find common ground, uh, quite the contrary, it destroys the very incentives that they have to reach agreement. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's too bad that the NLRB has become such a political punching bag because uh, I and many of my colleagues would certainly enjoy the opportunity to debate common sense proposals to improve the relationship between employers and employees. Uh, if we want to have a debate about the NLRB, let's have that debate directly, not uh, through some imposition uh, of, into judicial prerogative. Uh, let's bring in representatives from businesses and labor organizations. Let's hear from workers and businesses across America. Look, if there's improvements to be made to the process that can lead to quicker response times, that can lead to fairer adjudication, uh, uh, if there's improvements that American businesses and American workers can agree on to make the process work better for economic growth and prosperity, let's do it. This bill does none of that. Lead to more strikes, leads to greater economic uncertainty, leads to destruction of jobs, leads to an interruption in the ability of the chief executive of this country, whomever he or she may be, from implementing the law to the best of their ability. Uh, and it's a bill that is frankly a waste of our time to even debate here on the floor of the House since we know that it has no chance of passage. This bill is purely foot before us for political intentions to perhaps satisfy some fringe element somewhere that likes this bill and likes to bash the rights of workers. But there's a lot of important work for us to be done, work that is too important for us to waste our time on this form of political posturing, which only stands to destroy jobs, hurt the economy, and create greater uncertainty, damaging American businesses and American workers. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance. The gentlelady from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we need jobs in this country. There are nearly 12 million Americans unemployed and anxious to find work. President Obama and the Senate Democrats' policies of higher taxes, record spending, and bigger government have failed to create jobs or boost economic growth. Put simply, this economy is growing too slowly to replace the millions of jobs lost. The failure of the president's runaway spending, deficits, and debt is being felt by every family struggling to put food on the table and pay their mortgages. The March 2013 labor force participation rate is the lowest since 1979, and the one-month increase in March 2013 of 663,000 new people not in the labor force is the largest increase ever recorded for the month of March since this data started being collected in 1975. If these individuals, quote, not in the workforce, end quote, were counted in the official unemployment rate, that rate would increase to 11.2 percent. 
Additionally, there are 47.3 million Americans receiving food stamps, which is equivalent to 15 percent of the population and represents by far the largest number in history. This number stands in stark contrast to when President Obama took office and there were only 31.9 million Americans using food stamps. Today, nearly one in seven Americans is on food stamps. What a sad commentary about our country. All these statistics ultimately say the same thing. Everyday Americans will keep struggling until our economy turns around. Fortunately for the American people, House Republicans have a plan for helping restore economic growth and create jobs throughout the country. The liberal elite simply cannot understand that more spending does not mean more jobs. Reckless deficit spending, mounting debt, growing red tape, higher taxes, a confusing tax code, higher energy prices, and rampant uncertainty all have job creators playing defense. Campaigning for another failed stimulus and more job-destroying taxes, President Obama has repeatedly and falsely asserted that, quote, Congress isn't willing to move, end quote, legislation to facilitate job growth. While the President plays politics, House Republicans have been working and approving legislation to promote economic growth and job creation. The Republican plan for growth tears down barriers to job creation because jobs are priority number one. As part of this plan, we're working diligently to cut job-killing red tape that costs small businesses $10,585 per employee each year reduce gas prices and create jobs by producing more American energy, which is important since every penny increase per gallon of gas costs consumers $4 million per day. Simplify a job-killing tax code that cost Americans $168 billion in 2010 just to comply with it. Prevent job-killing tax hikes on small businesses. Reduce uncertainty by tackling the debt crisis with responsible spending cuts, and the Republican plan will get Washington out of the way and put American job creators back on the offense. Growing jobs and eliminating the deficit go hand in hand. To balance the budget, we need both spending cuts and real economic growth. With that, Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman reserves. Gentleman from Colorado. Well, it sounds like I, I agree with the gentle lady on many of our national priorities. For goodness sake, let's reform the tax code. Let's bring down rates, gas prices. My constituents are complaining about them. Let's take action, preventing tax increases, balancing the budget, making sure that we have a business climate that's friendly for small businesses. Why aren't we talking about any of that on the floor of the House today? Instead of to enshrining a D.C. District Court decision into statute to the detriment of job creation, to the detriment of American business, against many of those great concepts that my, my colleague uh, uh, Dr. Fox espoused. So, I mean, I think there's, there's got to be a connection here. I think the American people are smart enough to make it. It's great to pay lip service to those wonderful things that Democrats and Republicans want to pursue, but what are we doing with our legislative time that taxpayers pay for here on the House? We're trying to prevent the president from implementing the law that Congress has made. With that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield three minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for three minutes. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. The gentleman is recognized for three minutes. I thank my friend for yielding. Uh, in the summer of 2011, as the country continued to see rising deficits, members of the Congress knew that they had to do something about that in connection with the extension of what we call the debt ceiling, which lets the country borrow money to pay its bills. As a part of that agreement, uh, a large number of people from both parties voted for something that hasn't turned out very well, and it's called sequestration. This is not something that's just a word that gets tossed around in this chamber and has political consequences. It is having a real and negative impact on the country. I just came from a hearing of the Armed Services Committee, where the chairman of the, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense told us that nine battle groups and three bomber groups of our Air Force and our Navy planes have been grounded. About one-third of the nation's air capacity isn't flying. Across the country today, uh, people who are on Medicare who need chemotherapy treatments from their doctor's offices are finding that many doctors are declining to do chemotherapy treatments for cancer patients 
because of the cuts that take place in sequestration. I met earlier this week with employees of the Naval Sea Systems Engineering Command in Philadelphia, whom I represent. They are looking at a 20% pay cut because of furloughs. These are real problems that are affecting real people. The House is opting to do nothing about this. Nothing. The economists have told us that these ill-advised sequestration cuts will cost the economy 750,000 jobs this year. Mr. Van Hollen, my friend from Maryland, has a bill. And that bill says that we should save an amount of money equal to what the sequestration is allegedly saving and not have these cuts in cancer care and not have a third of our air power grounded and not have federal employees take a 20% pay cut. Mr. Van Hollen proposes that we cut subsidies to huge oil companies, that we cut subsidies to huge agribusinesses, and we have people who make more than $1 million a year in income pay a slightly higher tax rate. We're not, I understand, ladies and gentlemen of the House, that some would agree with that proposal and others would disagree with that proposal. That's democracy. We're not even taking a vote on that proposal because the majority Republican leadership has refused to put on this floor any piece of legislation that would stop this harm to the country. And I know they'll say it's the president's fault or it's the Senate's fault or it's who's ever. I'd ask for one more minute. Gentlemen's recognized for an additional.